All right. Thanks for being here this morning. I wasn't sure what the turnout would be at 9 a.m. on the first day, so appreciate that. Uh, my name is Rachel Eppler. I'm excited to be here. Okay. A bit louder. How's that? Better? Okay. Great. <laughs> Walking makes time reversible. This complex task of repairing what it means to be kin only starts when you arrive. Every stride is language that disrupts the ordered certainty, creating conditions for listening. Spaces and silences beyond speech draw distinctions between wrinkles and scars, possibilities inscribed in our bodies. The long haul of interdependency challenges the memory in our feet. In a different landscape, each step toward liberation summons the walkers. Entanglements of care can be an arduous task or a hesitant search. Clouds obscure the darkness. Winter is locked under ice. There is nothing to do but walk, a guidance for how to live. I wrote this as part of a series of winter walking texts last year when I was living as a guest in Amiskwachi, Wiskaiken, also known as Edmonton, Alberta. I'm a lifelong walker, a walking advocate. Many of us walk for health benefits, for pleasure, but beyond that, I am convinced that walking offers both a disruption and an invitation, a disruption to our often destructive human habits and an invitation to renew human and more than human relationships. What I want to share with you in my short time today are some interwoven thoughts and artworks and creative texts that consider walking as a form of listening, a reparative gesture, an intentional, even hopeful act. Walking and listening, walking in order to listen, moving our bodies toward attunement, listening and walking our way toward more just futures. Walking and listening bound up together necessitates an understanding of where we are walking. The walks I'm sharing with you today happened on Treaty 6 territory within Métis homelands and the traditional lands of the Cree, Diné, Nakota Sioux, Nitsitapi, and Anishinaabe peoples. So many walked and listened there before me, after me, alongside me. A score for winter walking. Go for a walk every day. Listen to what the snow, ice, sun, wind, trees, birds, structures, and beings tell your body about this place. Keep listening. This is the score I wrote for myself last year before arriving as a visitor to this place that was new to me. I walked there every day for 120 days, trying to be mindful of the instructions I had given myself. Sometimes I walked with other people. A few times I walked with groups. Many days I walked on my own. Each day I aimed to listen and to keep listening. I listened to the snow and ice, noticing how changing temperatures altered the consistency and the sound, squeaking or crunching, cracking or slushing. I listened with my ears. I listened with my feet. Even my eyelashes listened in that place when they froze with condensation from my breath. As someone trained in the practice of deep listening, I'm thinking in part with Pauline Oliveros and the ways that she incorporated movement as an activation of bodily listening in her compositions and in her pedagogy. Several times in her scores and meditations, she directs us to listen by taking a walk, to walk silently, giving attention to whatever is sounding, or to walk so silently that the bottoms of your feet become ears, or to walk as slowly as possible. Walking as listening moves, be, moves listening beyond our ears to a whole body awareness that includes feeling, sensing, perceiving, giving attention to our place within the ecologies we inhabit. Maybe this all begs the question, why am I walking and listening? There is an urgency to listening now in a time of late stage capitalism and climate collapse and individualist isolation and times of crises call us to listen differently. Discerning how to shift toward more sustainable futures demands 
demands that we listen as well as possible and in as many ways as possible. My current research focuses on listening through different modes of artistic practice, walking, writing, drawing, stitching. And my foundational proposal for all of this work is that listening is not just an action, but an orientation, a way of being in the world, a reciprocal gesture that invites relationality. Good listening, relational listening, what Salome Fogelin calls careful listening, is a listening toward engagement, a furthering of connection, with human and more than human relations, predisposing ourselves to a relational listening orientation through our actions, our gestures, our mindsets. I look to walking as just one of the artistic forms through which we might enact and facilitate reparative relational listening and an orientation that might help me approach attunement, a being in tune with this place and with some of its inhabitants. During my 120 days of walking, many days I walked on trails in the North Saskatchewan River Valley, where the trees stand tall, evergreen boughs bending under snow and ice, aspen and birch branches still bare in the cold winter. By walking the same paths, retracing my steps repeatedly, I came to learn more about this place, noticing small changes from day to day, repetition and lending a measure of intimacy. When I walked with other walkers, I listened to this place through their ears, their, their bodies. They told me of their experiences in this place, of their relationships to sound, to people, to the river, to birds, to traffic. I listened to their memories of arriving in this place recently or long ago, of families raised and friends come and gone, and I noticed how they listened, which senses they described through their listening, how they invoked their bodies. This is listening toward engagement, a furthering of connection, a deepened way of being in the world. And if we can walk our way toward attunement, toward the beginnings of relation with our fellow humans and multi-species beings, recognizing and listening to them with them, we will be more committed to helping develop shared futures. Winter walking, part six. Walking is an invitation to reorient, creating new patterns and alliances. Intertwined humans and trees find uneven rhythms, interdependence steadying with every step. The mother trunk and daughter branches wait patiently. Our bodies enliven a complex matrix, moving ahead, sideways and back through. Spidering lines take root. Our chaotic journeys tenderly inscribe collective kinships. Unruly webs flourish with restless determination and everyday commitment. Pay attention to the future still hidden. Our ability to imagine the vital necessity of walking might keep the world from falling apart. I'm just gonna grab my water. Of course, historically, there are various kinds of walking and listening. Uh, for the peripatetic school of ancient philosophers, movement facilitated thought and conversation, debating ideas and developing knowledge together. The Philosophenweg or philosophers walk found in various cities are named for later scholars and thinkers who walked as a way to work out concepts, listening to themselves. Others like Flaneur walked to map out a place, to see and be seen, to know, and be known. All of these examples highlight walking and listening as a way to acquire specific knowledge. What Dylan Robinson would, I think, term hungry listening. In his 2020 book, Robinson begins from the history and implications of settler colonial listening, where among the Stolo peoples, colonizers came to be known as starving ones because of their hunger for food and their hunger to consume the world around them. Robinson theorizes a decolonial listening practice that situates listening as a relational action rather than a consumption or appropriation. He posits the concept of listening as a guest rather than as a hungry consumer. One way to listen as a guest is to resist the drive for knowledge fixity 
the constant need to discover. If we listen otherwise with Robinson, we are not listening with the goal of knowledge acquisition, but listening toward relationship, toward sensory experience that connects us to place. So I think walking might be one way of listening otherwise, inhabiting a non-acquisitive mode of listening. Listening as a guest through walking, I suggest, has three components, pace, repetition, and a lack of fixed destination. The pace of walking, of slow movement, it's a pace to pay attention, to attune to place and its inhabitants. Vehicles transport us quickly across land, separating us from place, but the pace of walking embeds us in the landscape and reminds us that we are only one component of a complex ecosystem. Repetition, walking the same paths repeatedly, daily, durationally, breeds familiarity. And walking with a lack of destination, a lack of agenda, a lack of needing to acquire knowledge, walking just to walk, prepares us to inhabit a listening orientation, a position of not knowing, of learning, of openness, of curiosity. During my months of daily walking up north, the leadership and writing of local indigenous professor Dwayne Donald invited me to consider walking as a form of reparative listening and kinship building. He writes, quote, walking is an intrinsically relational activity that carefully attunes mind, body, and spirit to surrounding life energies. Attunement to these elemental relationships occurs when walking is enacted as a life practice through which the walker repeatedly recognizes the self as interwoven with the surroundings, end quote. He emphasizes repetition. It's not just one or two walks. To open ourselves to relational listening demands repeated, sustained engagement. Attentive walking is a life practice. Donald argues that we are in an era of relationship denial and that we need to repair these relations with each other and with the land and renew these relationships on kinship terms. He writes further, by walking and listening, people begin to perceive themselves differently. They feel enmeshed in relationships. They walk themselves into kinship relationality. During my 120 days, I found that the more I walked and the more I listened, the more I recognized humans and more than humans, the more they became familiar to me. Generalized dogs and their human walkers became specific over time as we encountered each other repeatedly on the paths. Certain trees became distinct to me as I noticed how they changed in sunshine or snow showers or evening darkness. I began to recognize the calls of magpies and the animals whose crisscrossing footprints preceded me across snowy landscapes. There was a snowshoe hare I watched my window who was always watching me and the sustained presence made it familiar to me, different from the other neighborhood hares hopping and chasing each other through yards. I listened with the coyotes whose yipping and howling haunted my walks and who made themselves seen unexpectedly on my night walks, reminding me that they too were listening. By repeatedly moving my body through the land, walking as part of a regular practice of being in this place, I aimed to set myself in a listening orientation opening up to relationship, recognizing myself and my fellow beings as connected to this place, recognizing our surroundings as kin, as relatives with whom we need to repair our relations. Winter walking part 10. Learning as we walk is a collective practice. Walking invites us to perceive at different tempos and scales, attending to landscapes with a rhythmic form of touch. Trails where we walk unmoor us from the familiar, unsettling and disrupting, remembering and reminding. Walking more slowly together re-enchants stories of rocks and trees, deceptively quiet knowledge fading to whispers. I suspect we are at the end of something and remaining aloof has dangerous implications, but places are never finished. More attention is required. If we understand ourselves as geologic subjects, we will wait with ice 
think with trees, walk through snow with new clarity. Ongoing encounters are messy and complex, strange and haunting, reframing our collective response. Call it simply listening. Thank you. Yeah, um, let's see. So I'll go back just a little bit here. So these are um, a series of, I don't exactly know what to call them. Um, I'm calling them graphite laser engravings. Um, they're, they're sort of drawings. I think of them as drawings. They start as a photograph. Uh, and then I'm working with a piece of, of paper in which I've um, adhered graphite to the surface, rubbed it all over. And, and so, and then the, I work with a laser engraver and it, it removes all of the light areas. Uh, so it's sort of a subtractive drawing. If anybody is, has ever done an erased charcoal drawing where you're using the eraser as a, the drawing tool, this is the laser as the drawing tool. Um, so that's what uh, some of these were. Um, and then some of them are, are digital prints. They're large scale, um, yeah, digital prints that I'm using with, with image and text. Uh, and then this installation that I had a couple of images of um, it's, I made a series of accordion books over 100 days. I walked for 120 days. I only made 100 accordion books, but it was sort of a, uh, you know, and the, the books weren't necessarily visualizations of the walking, but for me, they sort of represented um, a marker of a daily practice. And so I made 100 accordion books and I strung them together um, end to end and then um, braided 100 feet of cotton. Um, and they're, they're in this hanging installation at a museum show right now. So, yeah, thanks. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, and, and I feel like I'm, I'm just starting to sort of to think about how to ar articulate this, because for me, it's, it's not so much about whether you're walking quickly or slowly, it's about whether you're walking at all. Uh, you know, I think we're really good as humans at disconnecting from uh, everything else around us and being um, in our human bubble um, and in our vehicles. And I, I just think uh, the pace of walking uh, often forces us to understand that <laughs> there are other beings and other, you know, that it's not just us. And so I think there's something really key to that um, pace. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, and I've already heard like last night, I think there's discussion of this um, as well. Uh, yeah, and I think the key to it is, um, I mean, I think of it sort of akin to, do you know that phrase, uh, like parachute artists, like an artist who you know, drops in, maybe does a mural for the community without their input and then leaves. You know, and, and it's, it's a different kind of relationship. I, I think with uh, what I'm thinking more about is, is the ways that we can be, not, not that we're not interested in learning, but how can we open ourselves to being in relationship and through that, what we might learn. And so it's not about what we're trying to take. Like, I'm not gonna walk and try to take something from that walk to, to yeah. So I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's, it's part of it's about the, the mindset that we enter into the actions with. Um, and being aware and intentional and um, and and open to to hearing and listening what the land or the beings around us might have to say, yeah. And and so yeah. So I think there's a, there's a lot of learning to be done. So I'm not saying yeah, don't learn, but um, 
open, going into it with a sort of non-acquisitive mindset or non-extractive mindset is important. I mean, I don't know if that's possible for humans at this point, but you know, we can aspire to that. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, be prepared to unlearn. And I'm sorry, I realized I wasn't repeating questions either. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Apologies. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah. Um, I mean, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what was the question? Uh, yeah. So, so if I'm talking about how walking changes listening, how does no? Yeah. How does my listening change my walking? Um, I think it's made me think more about the different ways that I walk. Um, Yeah, I, I think I'm more aware of when I'm walking to a destination. I'm walking quickly. I'm walking with a, you know, going to the store or whatever. Like, I have a I have a mission that I I notice that during those times. I'm paying much less attention to everything else around me. You know, it's much easier to just be in my tunnel. Um, yeah. So it's not that I don't still do that sometimes, but I think it's it's made me more aware of what I really enjoy about walking is. Uh, when I can be more intentional and what, you know, and sometimes it's walking with a friend and how the walking facilitates just a different kind of conversation through the pace and through the movement. Um, yeah, and, and that uh, I no longer listen to podcasts when I walk just because I feel like that really takes me out of any kind of attempt to engage with other walkers on the paths or the land around me or, or, or the noticing if I'm listening to something in my earbuds, then that's what I'm hearing and that's what I'm sensing and it's easy to block out a lot of other things. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that it's not just about mobility. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, and I appreciate you bringing that up because I noticed that, uh, yeah, I've had some really, what feel like really powerful experiences where I've accompanied people who don't walk very well. And yeah, and it's, it's not about the walk. It's about the being together and there's some slow, very slow movement and, and it feels like a real gift to be moving with somebody and not wanting to help them, uh, but to, yeah, just to be there to sort of witness um, what they are attempting to do. And yeah, it, it, again, I think for me, it's very much about the relational exchange that this sort of slow movement facilitates. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was just, I know we're out of time, so I was just gonna say, I do have, um, some small catalogs if anybody's interested um, from a, a show that I have called Invitations to Listen, and I'm happy to give them away if anybody wants. There's a short essay that I, the curator wrote about my work. So anyway, so thanks so much.